So um, I, first, I dive right in. Um, everybody says 2016 is going to be the year of VR. Um, you guys working in this in this space, do you think that's the case, or do you think we're going to be um, still a little bit while a little ways away from that mass adoption, the tipping point that everybody seems to talk about? I, I, I guess I'm not doing this. Anybody wants to chime in? I'm not going to. This is for everybody. Most of these questions are directed towards everybody. So. Well, I guess uh, I guess I can take the first stab at that. Uh, uh, hey everybody, it's Milan. Uh, I'm from a VR company just outside here, exhibiting called Pinch. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, when's VR going to take off? We thought it was going to take off like when was it, 10, 15 years ago, when those first uh, those first hardware prototypes hit the market, and, and we kind of saw the first uh, Johnny Pneumatics. Did anyone ever watch that movie? Johnny Nemanic or the, uh, what was the other one? Oh man, there's like so many, so many aspirations that we have to when VR and, and AR is gonna kinda hit the mainstream and we're all gonna be able to reap the benefits. But my honest opinion is that next year, absolutely commercial VR will take off for a specific demographic. I still think uh, it's a ways away from being kind of mass market ready uh, not that the tech is not ready. I think that the tech is obviously getting smaller, it's getting a lot more sophisticated. I just think that the overall social frictions around mounting something on your face, um, especially if you have to kind of mount on your face, then connect it to a computer, then connect something else to your arm, and then connect something else to the back of your head. Like it's, it's just, it's, it seems to be like a psychological limit to jumping into it. So I think next year definitely makes a lot of sense for our kind of folks that are hardcore into it, the gamers. Uh, but for everybody else, like I don't know if my mom's gonna jump into it. Maybe in a couple of years, once it you know looks like you know a pair of glasses or something, I think she'll she'll take the plunge. But I still think it'll be quite a limited market. That's just my opinion. Um, I, I'd say that we we are definitely planning for it. It's in almost every single one of our pitches that go out to our clients. We know they all want it. Um, but it still it feels like we're in the sort of calm before the storm right now. The same kind of feeling I was getting before the iPhone had launched and all the developers had access to the, the <laughs> iOS SDK and, and stuff. But um, come early next year, when the Oculus becomes actually commercially available and uh, the Samsung Gear November is out, it, it's kind of a whole other ball game. Right now, you can actually buy every single app on the Samsung store um, you know, with like 30 downloads or something like that, not that much money. Uh, in a, six months from now, I don't think that's gonna be the case. And while it kind of feels like, felt like not that much is being done, we were at Oculus Connect last week and I, I feel like I got a real, a much better idea about how much is actually under development right now. So come January, it's gonna be a completely different ball game. I wanted to jump ahead then, because Ben, you mentioned client. And I think it's interesting that the vast majority of the experiences that I see, especially on the mobile VR space, are all branded content, which bothers some people, including myself. But I mean, I understand why, I mean, money. Um, but how long before do you think we're gonna get away from all this, this basically this advertising in, in this space? I think that the, the, the advertising companies ingesting the money is helping us build what VR is and whatever to come after that or how we're, like this is the start of how we're gonna change and how we perceive media. And I think that as we're putting people in, in HMDs, the more that we get everyone in, once we have everyone in, we're gonna start taking them off and seeing that the world around has actually changed with things like augmented reality and holograms, tracking, um, you know, data, data collection as Anna was speaking about. All of these things in the next two years is going to change Everything, storytelling, and we can't, I don't think we can get away with it. I mean, as Anna was saying that we have a choice, I don't think we have a choice. I think we're already plugging in who we are, like our signatures into our computers, into everything. And, and I've been doing a lot of more research than that, you know, expanding from VR, and it's quite interesting. So we have to change, we're going to be changing the way we tell stories based on all of this analytical data that we're picking up and all of these things that we can sort of like create in front of us, which is amazing and scary at the same time. So I think VR is a, is a good gateway. I think that uh, you know, the brand's putting money in is good, but I think we need guys like Ellie 
who's like, I think a raw filmmaker, and, and he's sticking to his guns, and he's making film. And it's, it's 180 degrees, and people like sometimes turn their nose. I, I know most of these guys, actually I know all of these guys on the panel, but uh, you know, some people turn their nose up to 180 <laughs> degrees, but I think what he's doing is brilliant, right? And I, and I think it's because, so yeah, like you, you don't want to waste your time looking back. I think that everyone, that you know, we're trained to look forward at media, so Ellie's sort of starting to shift that a bit. And I think that's a good translation from what film is into you know, what VR is going to be, into what the next sort of media, how we're going to perceive media is going to be, right? So. A question for the people who, who are working in film with VR, like Ellie and me, obviously you're making non-branded narrative content, but I mean, everybody's content is narrative. It just doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean if it has a company's logo on it, it can't tell a story. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, what are the, some of the challenges in, in creating compelling narrative content in virtual reality? I mean, for us, like I stated in my, my showcase, we, we didn't know how to tell a story in VR. We had to kind of figure it out. And we saw the, the 360 degrees as, as, a, as a little bit of a problem. I mean, I, I think, um, as, as Stefan mentioned in his, his talk, like there are ways to you know, bring the viewer into, where, into a direction you want them to go. Um, but we kind of worked within those limitations and said, how can we, you know, sorry, VR would get, what VR gives the, um, the viewers agency, right? Uh, the ability to see what they want to see. What we wanted to do was give that agency back to the director. And, you know, maybe that's a little different or maybe that's a little traditionalist, but I think that, you know, there, there needs to be a way to tell that story and for the viewer to get that story. And that's the approach we took. I mean, do you guys, you guys working in VR, do you think you have a, a leg up over, let's say XYZ big name Hollywood director says, oh, I'm going to make a, a VR piece now. That guy who has maybe 25 years of experience in, in traditional filmmaking, do you think he, he's at a disadvantage to, to you guys who are basically no, in I it think, from I, the beginning? I mean, I, and you know, a lot of guys that trained me as a director, it's funny, I talked to some of them and, and half of them Get, I get it, and the other, like, some of them are like, well, where's the front of the camera? And, and it's like, well, there's no front. And they're like, well, how do you edit? And I'm like, we're still figuring that out. And they're like, uh, you know what I mean? And, and so, and so some, they just, they're just like, I don't, I don't understand. It's like, it's, you know, it's, it's something different. Like, you know what I mean? We're, we're telling immersive stories, right? And, and there's so many different tools to do that. So, you know, a big Hollywood director, you know, versus the next guy that really understands technology, there's a new balance, right? And because we're creating a new medium, this is not film. This is this is immersive media that we're that we're creating. Yeah, I I, I, I would agree. I think a, a lot of folks are overestimating. You know, let's say if we were to combine all of our expertise here on the panel, I think it's still pretty safe to say we have no idea what the hell we're doing. Like this is like <laughs> the beginning of something completely new. And for me to sit here and say, I've been in VR for a year and a half, two years, and to say that I know what the right convention is to put together something or how to tell a story is completely BS. I think anybody that has an idea and that has something that they want to portray, it's, it's just, how I see it is just a limitless canvas. And you can do whatever the heck you want to do. Um, if it makes sense for your story or for your content, then do it. Like there's no conventions. We're all still trying to figure out What's the, you know, the keyboard and mouse equivalent in VR? We, we, we still don't know that. A lot of the headsets that are shipping and all these things they still don't have any kind of very natural way to interact. We don't know kind of where's the menu? How do I go home? How do I go to the next chapter? How do I press, you know, uh, press pause or stop or whatever? So it's really kind of uh, the Wild West right now. Everyone's still trying to figure it out. I did actually want to ask something about UX in a second, but I know Josh wanted to, to say something. Yeah, I, so, so. I would just say, and, and just to mirror what these these folks have said, but we don't uh, we don't have the burden of like I, I think to your point of the the director who has twenty five years of film experience, we don't have the burden of knowledge, and I really I really I'd frame it that way. It's not that we don't know a lot about; it's that we don't have the baggage of the past to have to hold on to. You know, when people approach this from completely fresh canvas, they can do innovative and interesting things, and I think it's okay. You're going to get crazy things that don't work, but you also will get things that are innovative and new, and that's how you build the mouse of the future, the keyboard of the future. So I, I try to flip it on the other coin and say, that's a great thing, and that's why we're going to be able to break shit and make it better. I, I, I like that little comment you made about VR possibly being the last medium 
Can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if we really kind of take a look at, at what this is, we're replacing sight and audio for a user. That's kind of the dream of almost every medium. When we go back in time and look at a cave painting, we're trying to recreate something and put a user back there. So we've got two of the senses, and we're slowly taking over all of these other areas. So, I mean, effectively, this could be the last medium that continues to evolve in an, in, in, you know, an Android iPhone-like way every year where there's a new release, and ooh, cool, this is the smell year. You know, we get something fun. But I, I really do think that is the potential future we see, like, ahead of us. So I wanted to, to, to rewind and get, get a little bit more technical and talk about UX. I was actually at the Immerse conference, and one of the speakers there, uh, Karis O'Connell, was talking about UX and UI and VR. And one of the things that he, he showed was all these uh, movie UI and UX experiences, like the Minority Report, and, and he, he thought it was so humorous that so many VR companies are trying to incorporate these ridiculous <laughs> UX experiences oh, yeah. into virtual reality. And, and as designers, can you talk about, I mean, how do you do, can, do that kind of exp uh, UI in VR and not make it look like some, you know, unusable, un unintelligible mess. Yeah, I, okay, I mean, I, I might as well take this one because I've been dealing with this problem for the last two years. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just gonna get ready to jump into this. Okay, so you guys ready? So here's the problem. You have these arms that you use every day, and you have your hands, and the majority of the action that happens with the hands, and obviously the way that you interact with objects every day, is with kind of these guys here, the index finger and the thumb. And we have this, um, just like you mentioned earlier, we have this kind of need to get the whole body into the experience, which I, I completely agree. I think that's really where it's going until we just literally plug our psyche into the network, right? Like that's, that's, that's like the next thing. But before I go crazy on that, what, what's really interesting about interaction is that people overestimate how much of the body you actually need in the VR experience um, to actually make it believable. And what I mean by that is a lot of folks are trying to get things like all the nuances of, of all the fingers, uh, all the movements of the hand into the interface, when you actually need a lot less than that. I mean, we've, we've actually proven that with, you know, the device you're using right now, the multi-touch display. You know, you only need kind of like two endpoints um, or two hands or two, uh, two fingers to actually interact in a lot of different ways. I mean, you can, you can come up with hundreds of gestures that are very natural. Um, and very accessible to folks, and, and they just get it as soon as they kind of put it on. And I completely agree. I mean, I, 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 I kind of look back at some of these sci-fi movies that I watched as a kid, and it's like this guy is kind of like doing all these weird things, and it looks so cool. But when you actually try to make it work, like in real life, like to actually click a button, or to go back, or to scale, or to move something around, um, it's actually a lot more intuitive than what we think um, it's going to look like. Um, and I think the, the simplest solution always, is always the one that, that makes the most amount of sense, and that's really kind of where we've been playing a lot. So you'd be surprised, really, how, how efficiently um, you, can, you can get that experience of presence uh, by not trying to overdo it, by not trying to overcomplicate things. Hopefully that makes sense. So we, uh, I sort of want to um, just ask you guys a little question about um, mobile VR and a lot of the experiences that uh, some of the filmmakers are using are using Gear VR as an a, a entry-level point for VR. Do you think that that's, that's really going to make what... I'm tip, tripping over myself here a little bit, but do you think mobile VR is going to be the, the entry point for most people and then those uh, expensive desktop experiences are going to be something that maybe only a very small amount of users are, are willing to invest in? I think so. I think, I mean, mobile VR, I mean, everyone here, we, everyone has VR in their pocket right now. So you have a Google Cardboard, and then you're in VR. And then if you think about that, you know, something like Google Cardboard is just cardboard. It's cheap. You know, you can transport it. So, you know, our old cell phones are reaching you know, far across the world to places that don't have technologies like we have. So what's going to hit there first? So if we're going to expand, you know, globally with VR, the first thing that's going to be is going to be 
phones and Google Cardboard. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, it's almost going to just pass its way along the world. And I think that's it, it's obviously the starting point. But do you think that with higher end VR, like if, if something is so compelling, people will pay whatever it takes to, to get that experience. So I, I personally think that idea that VR is too expensive is, is not actually the case. Would you guys agree with that? I mean, and, and, and all, and not just mobile, <laughs> but like everything, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Hey there. So we are definitely targeting the, the higher end experiences, and I think it was interesting to see Oculus come out and release um, like official specs for Oculus Ready machines uh, at Oculus Connect last week. And you know, something to note is that it's not out of the realm of possibilities for consumers to buy that machine. It's probably around two thousand dollars or so, maybe slightly more, um, which. I think is pretty much in line with like modern computers these days. Um, and if you can make something run on a 970 with 16 gigs of RAM and an i5, like you're golden. You're golden for traditional games, for VR games, and I think it's something that's pretty achievable, especially given, you know, the te technology we have these days. I mean, Unreal 4 is amazing. It's free. It works on VR, 2D games, every um, platform imaginable. So, I think. It's actually pretty achievable to do it um, for the full-blown desktop, desktop experience as well. And I don't see that as being a, like a giant barrier to entry. OK, so what are we here for time? OK, so actually I'm going to do two last things then. Uh, to Oh, well, I need to get maybe a few audience questions. Maybe you can give me two more minutes afterwards. So I'm just going to go down the, the panel here, and I'm going to ask two questions and ask everybody to answer. Uh, the first question is, can you each maybe give us an example of something you can do in VR and I'm, that's outside of gaming or filmmaking, and just maybe give us a sentence about how you think VR can and change or improve that, and just maybe each of you give us an example, because we've, we've talked so much about games and films, but not anything else. So I'll, let's start from maybe. S sorry, you want to? I, I just want to maybe give the audience an example you can think of like, of how VR can be used for something other than like films film or, games. or gaming, or right? Training.